What happens to a Greek army when the war is over, but the journey home has only just begun? What do you do with 10,000 survivors stranded deep inside Persia with no king, no allies, and no safe road back? How do they cross frozen Armenian mountains, survive hunger, betrayal, and constant pursuit, and still reach the Black Sea alive? And when they finally disappear from the record, did they really go home, or did Greek blood quietly remain behind, hidden in the people of the lands they passed through? You've heard of famous retreats in history. Napoleon from Russia, armies fleeing defeat. But more than 2,000 years ago, a retreat happened that should have been impossible. 10,000 Greek soldiers, deep inside enemy territory, surrounded, betrayed, leaderless, and somehow they survived. But here's the question historians rarely ask. When the 10,000 finally escaped, where did they go next? Did they simply walk back into Greece and disappear into the past? Or did they leave something behind, something written not in stone, but in blood? The year is 401 BCE. The Persian Empire dominates the known world, stretching from the Aegean Sea to the edge of India. Inside this vast empire, a Persian prince named Cyrus the Younger is plotting to overthrow his brother, King Artaxerxes II. To do it, he hires mercenaries, Greek mercenaries, hardened hoplites from Sparta, Athens, Arcadia, Thessaly, men trained for close combat, shield to shield, spear to spear. They number just over 10,000. At first, they're told they're marching to suppress local unrest. Only later do they realize the truth. They are marching on the Persian king himself. The armies clash near Kunaxa, north of Babylon. The Greeks fight with terrifying efficiency, shattering the Persian forces in front of them. But victory collapses in an instant when Cyrus is killed. And suddenly, the Greeks understand the nightmare they're in. They are alone, hundreds of miles from home, inside the heart of the greatest empire on earth. Persian commanders offer negotiations. The Greek generals accept. It's a trap. The leaders are seized and executed. Overnight, the 10,000 are decapitated. This should have been the end. Instead, leadership falls to an unlikely man, Xenophon. Not a general, not even a professional soldier, a philosopher, a student of Socrates. And under his guidance, the army makes a decision that will echo through history. They will march north, across hostile lands, across mountains, rivers, and frozen plateaus. They will fight their way home. They move through Mesopotamia, into Armenia, then across the brutal highlands of Anatolia. They are attacked constantly. Men freeze to death. Others vanish in snowstorms. Arrows fall from unseen enemies in the hills. Food is scarce. Morale is fragile. And then one day they see it. The Black Sea. Thalata, Thalata. The sea, the sea. Xenophon records their survival, their triumph over impossible odds. And then the story ends. But history doesn't, because survival creates a deeper mystery. What happened to the 10,000 after they reached the sea? Did every man return to Greece, or did some stay behind, settling in unfamiliar lands, blending into new populations? Ancient sources are silent. Genetics is not. Modern genetic research has revealed something strange. Across parts of northern Turkey, along the Black Sea coast and into regions of Armenia and the Caucasus, scientists find unexpected genetic markers, markers closely related to ancient mainland Greek populations. Not from later Roman rule, not from classical colonization, but earlier, scattered, uneven. Exactly what you'd expect from displaced soldiers, not settlers. Think about the reality these men faced. Years of war, thousands of kilometers narched, friends buried in foreign soil. Some were wounded, some were exhausted, some had no homes left to return to. 
ancient armies didn't offer pensions or second chances. What they offered was survival, and sometimes a new beginning. Frontier regions needed warriors. Local rulers needed experienced fighters. Some Greeks stayed, some married, some raised families. Their names disappeared from history. Their DNA did not. Genetic studies support this. The markers found in these regions resemble ordinary mainland Greek ancestry, not elite colonists or administrators. Multiple city-states, mixed origins, the exact makeup of the 10,000 themselves. And the genetic signal appears suddenly, then fades over generations. A brief pulse, not a permanent wave. Armenia stands out. Xenophon describes it as one of the harshest regions of the march. Deep snow, frozen villages, men disappearing beneath drifts. Yet this is where genetic traces persist, because it was a bottleneck. Injured men stayed behind, others deserted, some were absorbed into local communities. History remembers generals and victories, genetics remembers everyone. For centuries, historians treated the 10,000 as a temporary anomaly, an army that marched in and marched out. But human movement doesn't work that way. People settle, they mix, they leave descendants behind. Genetics forces us to confront what the texts overlook. So what's the answer? Did Xenophon's 10,000 leave a genetic legacy? Yes, not as a nation, not as a people, but as quiet threads woven into the populations they passed through. Their legacy isn't monuments or cities, it's ancestry, fragments of Greek DNA carried for centuries by families who never knew where it came from. Xenophon's Anabasis isn't just a military memoir, it's a reminder that history doesn't end when the story does. Sometimes it lives on inside us. If you enjoy uncovering the hidden genetic stories behind ancient history, this is what we do here on Genealogy X. Like the video, subscribe, and tell us in the comments which forgotten journey we should trace next.